This program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area. Informed Sources is made possible in part by Susie and Pierre G. Villery. Quiet on the set. Soon we will all be more informed. We appreciate learning more of our region's news and public affairs. Cameras rolling. Hello, I'm R.C. Kavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, every legislative session ends amidst the ashes of bills that were talked about and debated, but that died in the end. But then there are the newly sprouted rules that deal with new issues or try to fix old problems. We will look at the legislative session just passed and at the performance of the new governor, whose agenda included, uh, included making change in New Orleans, including its sewage and water board. We will also analyze the New Orleans Police Department's consent decree and where it stands. In Kenner, the local casino now stands firmly on the land rather than in a boat. And in eastern New Orleans, developers are hoping that the former Six Flags site can be a treasure chest of its own. Joining us are tonight's informed sources, Errol Aboard, producer of informed sources, Missy Wilkinson, staff writer, the Times Picayune, the New Orleans advocate, David Jacobs, senior State House reporter, La Politics Weekly, and Ben Meyer, staff writer of the Times Picayune, the New Orleans advocate. David, let's go on over to you because the session came to an end. How did the governor do on his first legislative session as governor? Well, one of the big themes of the session was the governor consolidating his power. Louisiana's governor is very powerful traditionally, and Jeff Landry, of course, went into this session with a Republican supermajority. Uh, but he basically moved to consolidate his power. He's got more control now over the State Board of Ethics, uh, which is investigating him, by the way. Um, he's got more control over boards and commissions statewide. Mm -hmm. um, he has remade, to some extent, the Coastal Protection Board in, in his, to his specifications. Um, he wasn't able to completely gut the public records law, but he was able to get a sort of carve out for his own schedule. Uh, but we also saw some of the limitations of his power, and that was most obvious in his constitutional convention mm -hmm. proposal, uh, which never it got through the House um, after some very intense lobbying and several amendments, never even got a hearing in the Senate. The senators basically just said, no, thank you, we're not interested. Um, now, we may revisit that constitutional question in the near future. The governor could simply call a special session where the agenda would be constitutional amendments. But the constitutional con convention uh, was was killed on the Senate side, and it never really had a chance. What was Cameron Henry, Henry's ob objection to it or concern about it? Well, it, it was basically that the governor never really laid out, here's what we need to change. Everyone kept saying the, the Constitution's too long, it's too complicated, um, it locks up too much money, so when the legislators get to Baton Rouge, half the money's already spent. But there wasn't a very clear uh, message from the governor in terms of, here's what we want to change. Mm -hmm. And so when you don't have that, then people start to worry, well, wait a minute, what about my homestead exemption? What about our tax breaks for food and for medicine, right. things like that, things that people care about. And so you're worried about, well, if I'm going to lose that and you're not able to tell me in clear terms how I'm going to benefit, there's just, it's just hard to make the case. E? You wanted to? I think that was, that that was pretty that much. That was a jump on it, that it did one. seem like Sorry. a lot, putting a constitutional convention right into a regular session. Yeah. In, in any year, that's a lot. Of, yeah. A lot yeah, of demands and, there. And, and that was the other part of it, too, is that people were just saying, well, what's the rush? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's we're going to rush through this in a couple of weeks and write a whole new constitution. And they would say, well, we're not writing a whole new constitution. We're just taking stuff out of the constitution and putting it in statute. But again, it's still, it's scary to people when they don't know what's going sure. to change. And so a special session, if that would be called, it would be called to do what? To add to more to the Constitution? It would not be to add more to. It would basically be the same goal. Like you would have um, 
if, if it was successful, you would maybe come out of there with a set of constitutional amendments that would say, we're going to take this out of the Constitution, we're going to take that out of the Constitution, and then it would all go to the voters in that constitutional amendment process that we're all used to that we, that we get every year. So public records, I mean, that was, you know, something that really caused a lot of controversy also, um, yeah. is not releasing these public records. Where do we end up on that? Well, again, it, it didn't, basically it didn't pass. I mean, what they were proposing essentially would have gutted the public records law. Um, that, that was not, that died. Um, but they did get, um, again, they did get a limited uh, exemption for the governor's travel records, which is supposed to be for security reasons. And there was also something, a very strange provision at the very last minute, where if you're not a Louisiana resident, if you're an out-of-state resident, you can't request public records from the governor's office. Uh, that was tacked on just, it, that was an amendment that was added to one of the bills and maybe the second to last or last day of the session. That seems like an easy thing to get around. Which one? The, the what about if you're not a... a, a well, and, and that was sort of the argument that was made, is yeah. that, well, if you're the New York Times, you can just have, you know, a stringer in Louisiana right. request mm -hmm. the records. Right. Um, and and, and so, so hopefully that, that would be the case, um, is that, that it would still, you would still have a workaround if you're a national media outlet, but it would just be a little bit more complicated. And it would be, it would supposedly cut down on frivolous, excessive... Uh, requests from out-of-state groups. So, um, what would be the assessment overall of um, the the governor? What he got, what he didn't. You know, was this a win for him? I would say largely a win. Yeah, it, it would be. Again, the, the constitutional convention thing is the big glaring exception, um, and, and you really do see. You know, he's been very aggressive, and, and you do see where that comes up short. And you do wonder that this huge push, the most ambitious thing that he pushed for so far in his administration, to, to really get smacked down that way, you wonder if that sort of punctures that air of, of inevitability of his agenda, and if maybe that makes him look a little bit weaker down the line. But if you look at the totality since he became governor and since the legislators became legislators um, with that crime session, yep. and then with this, if you combine those, it seems like... It, they've done a lot of lawmaking. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, a lot definitely did happen. And you did note the Coastal Board, the, the Coastal uh, Protection and Restoration Authority. So he changed the composition of the board, but he also at first talked about moving that authority under what, the Department of Energy and Natural Resources? Yeah, and, and they, they wouldn't put it quite, quite that way, but yes, and, and there's, that's still <clears throat> it's sort of a work in progress, that there's going to be potentially some... Uh, some sort of back office functions being combined and things like that. Um, it's, they're, they're very sensitive to the idea that, that CPRA is going to be sort of sort of <clears throat> shunted under DENR, um, but, but that did raise some, some alarm bells for a lot of the coastal folks. It did. It, it definitely yeah. did. The coastal advocates are very, very concerned about that, including a bunch of business people uh, right. who wrote a letter saying, look, we're concerned because we have made progress. We don't want to stop. Right. All right. Okay. Well, we'll see if we're going to come up with a special session then. But certainly a lot did happen. I mean, yeah. certainly more than what we just talked about here. Sure. But um, very busy time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, David. Thank you. Ben, some other stuff that came up or did not happen in the, the legislative session was regarding the Sewage and Water Board. The well, first thing we'll talk about is the money they were hoping to get for that power station. It didn't happen. They had a $29 million request for capital outlay money um, for what is arguably the most critical infrastructure project in the city, um, the power complex for the Sewage and Water Board to keep the, uh, the pumps running during heavy storms. Um, <clears throat> it appeared to be uh, on track. I don't think there was ever any guarantee, but it, l it looked like um, this was something that w wasn't controversial, mm -hmm. and everyone had said they supported it. Um, things changed suddenly a couple of weeks ago um, after uh, Mayor Cantrell uh, made some comments at a sewage and water board meeting um, criticizing some of the other bills um, that uh, were, were being passed or considered and passed uh, having to do with the sewage and water board. Um, that those bills were sponsored by New Orleans delegation members, and I think her comments caught people off guard. Um, I, who knows exactly uh, where the breakdown was, but the result um, was that um, there was zero dollars for the uh, for the power complex and the capital outlay budget. And that was expected. So, I mean, is that firm? Is there no money forthcoming, or is the governor Not saying maybe something down the line? 
I, I think it's likely that there's going to be some other source of funding um, to make up for it. Um, I, this seemed to be more of a statement um, by lawmakers, I think, in response to the mayor's comments. Um, the governor called a press conference this week uh, to announce some kind of funding improvement for the complex, whatever that means. Um, he called it off because of a scheduling conflict, but I would expect within not too long from now, we're going to hear some kind of an announcement of additional funding. So going into the session, you know, there was a special task force looking at, you know, the Sewage and Water Board and having recommendations, et cetera. What did come out of the legislature regarding the Sewage and Water Board? Um, number one, um, there's a bill, this is the one that the mayor was criticizing. Um, about uh, consolidating drainage, uh, so the catch basins, the catch basins and the um, larger um, drainage functions uh, famously are uh, separated, mm -hmm. um, and that has been a failure. So this bill, so catch basins under city drainage functions under sewage and water board. So the bill does what? The bill like requires the sewage and water board to take over the catch basins, but it does not provide any instruction or timing or money for how that will happen. Um, it's still te technically legally now it is supposed to happen much needs to occur on the ground and in negotiations between sewer to water board and the city for it to actually happen you know the city did have money for these catch basins right so could that just be directed now over to the sewage and water board i mean how can the sewage and water board do this without the funding underneath it well they say they can't um and this is where the um talks to do this has broken down in the past um technically the bill does say that whatever the city paid in 2023 for catch basin work is what the sewage and water board would get but no one knows what that is because there's no budget line item for it basically the city just responds to complaints when they clean out catch basins and there are a lot of them to be cleaned out too uh, oh tons 72,000 and, and, and very important thing certainly now in hurricane season definitely we want to see those things cleaned out okay some other issues regarding billing too right and I mean that's another important people issue for people who live in the city oh that's right um, and um, it's super important also politically because uh, a lot of legislators are saying that you know we, we can't really move forward with improvements to sewage and water board until this billing thing is, is fixed so um, number one um, there's a there's going to be a new dispute resolution process in which like special arbitrators will be placed in each council district they're supposed to be easily accessible and you go there before you go through the kind of Byzantine uh, process that's in place now through the sewage and water board and they're supposed to um, quickly uh, adjudicate your claim and if the if these special arbitrators find in your favor the sewage and water board has to accept it um, and if you're not dis if not satisfied with the result, then you can go through the more complicated process. Okay. Um, secondly, um, estimates have, are, are being banned now um, in the in the calculation of your water bills. That's going to start next year. The idea being that as this smart meter project rolls out, in which everyone's going to get automated water meters, um, uh, they won't need to use estimates as much. Okay. Um, Sewer and Water Board says that they have to use estimates in some circumstances um, until we get the smart meters. Um, so it kind of remains to be seen how this is going to be like kind of play out. And is there a choice like for leveling billing? Yes, sort of yeah, that's that? it. Thank you. Um, the other thing um, is that uh, customers will now be given a choice of having just leveled um, straight water bills based mm -hmm. on some calculation that we haven't figured out yet, but um, of, of recent, <laughs> of recent okay. bills. Um, so you can either keep getting billed the way you are, or you can um, have one constant bill until you get your smart. Okay, but governor, governance stays the same. That was not changed at all. That was not changed after a lot of um, yeah. concern about that. Yeah, all right. All righty, thanks a lot, Ben. Okay, now Missy, over to you. The NOPD consent decree. There have been some court hearings about that, a couple of them, one and two, and so what are we finding out? So on Wednesday, we had the second part of the two-part bias-free policing mm -hmm. um, hearing. It was the data-heavy portion of the bias-free policing portion of the consent decree. Um, overall high marks from the court. Um, the NOPD's internal audit, which reviewed you know, all, a lot of their calls for service, found that you're not going to get arrested for driving while black, basically, mm -hmm. which is a thing that used to happen. People, there was racial profiling. They found no disparity among races of people pulled over. They did find a disparity that they thought could reveal bias among response times. Response times in primarily black neighborhoods are higher um, than they are in primarily white neighborhoods. And that's largely fueled by the seventh district, which comprises New Orleans East and is mm -hmm. geographically one of the most wide ranging. They considered that as a factor. Um, they also considered basically the 
duration of the calls and how mm -hmm. time intensive they are. Um, and so that is one thing that they're crafting some action in order to address. They've already deployed, they started in January a pilot program in which more officers will be deployed to the 7th district and they've already seen uh, down ticking in those response times. Um, but that was a red flag. And the other thing was um, there was some evidence of disparity in women um, as far as traffic stops and pat downs. And the NOPD has no idea why that might be right now. Um, so there's more women are being asked to step out of the car and then pat down. Something. Well, basically fewer. So when they're pulling over a woman or patting down a woman, that is less likely to culminate in an arrest. And the idea is mm -hmm. that if you're pulling over a suspect who is actually doing something illegal, that would be more likely to culminate in an arrest. So NOPD is trying to understand why women are less likely to be arrested after getting pulled over or after getting patted down um, compared to men. And they don't really have any hypotheses about that right now. So all of this data was compiled by whom? It was an internal audit by NOPD, and they used methodology devised by the Department of Justice. Um, they did furnish this data to the Times-Picayune. We did review it, um, and it, it does seem sound. Uh, there are members of the community, uh, the black community, who do question the veracity or, I guess, the reliability of the data. They would have liked to have seen a black data analyst be part of the process, and they also would have liked community services or community surveys to be part of the process. What about the independent police monitor, the response from, uh, from her? Her response is concern that we are responding to very real um, allegations of, of bias, of racial pro pro profiling mm -hmm. with a lot of math. And mm -hmm. um, she wants to see more community engagement throughout this process. Um, she wants to see more transparency, more presence of people in the courtroom, um, and just more dialogue between the monitors and between the primarily African-American community who, um, at the public hearing on Thursday that was debriefing this hearing, expressed a lot of concerns about the potential exit from federal oversight based on their lived experiences. So what is the likelihood of, um, you know, an exit from it anytime soon? Well, um, Judge Susie Morgan has not been specific about when that might be. Um, she has signaled that it may be imminent because she has requested from federal monitors um, several documents for the public, including an FAQ, um, including some documents about what sustainment will look like, just the nuts and bolts of how that works. She hasn't yet received those. Um, and I think it's important to note that the NOPD is still executing a remedial action plan that was crafted in November um, after they were found to be non-compliant due to their investigation of Officer Rappi, the mayor's mm -hmm. bodyguard. Um, so that's still a thing that's going on. Um, the PCABs still are not really functioning the way they're intended to, um, so that's a thing that needs to happen as well. Um, but it does seem like the mood in the courthouse was positive and that it might be soon. So that the like you say, positive, that progress is being made and we're moving along with it. So what happens when there is an exit? What goes on then? Well, I think that that is part of what federal monitors in the city are trying to <coughs> hammer out. Um, but basically, when the judge finds that she can move all these 17 areas of the consent decree into the green, say we're compliant in all these areas that were targeted for reform, that would initiate a two-year period of step-down monitoring, step-down federal oversight. It's not the end of federal oversight. It is a different phase in the game. And we're still going to have to wait and see exactly how that's going to look. And so that's two years, two years more. Okay. Right. So what is the superintendent's feelings ab about all of this? She um, has consistently felt that she, NOPD is almost there. She's just ready to take it across the finish line. She feels like this is a really strong force that has really worked hard and consistently over the last decade mm -hmm. to remedy the evils of the past. Um, she addressed them very bluntly at the consent decree hearing on Wednesday, um, apologizing for the way that our black residents had been brutalized by the NOPD and, you know, stating her firm desire to work with the community to continue to implement these reforms and continue to make positive changes. Okay. And it was no surprise to her when she was being interviewed. I mean, part of the discussion was, you got to deal with the consent decree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was one of her stated three goals, was just to get us into compliance, to move all those areas into the green and initiate the next phase. Okay, we'll see what that next phase will be then and when it will happen. Yes. All right, Missy, thanks a lot. Okay, e, what was a, a, a gambling boat is now land-based. Hot times in Kenner. Um, you know, you go back to the 1970s when there was talk actually nationally about not letting Las Vegas have all the fun. Why don't we have gambling within our communities? And certainly in Louisiana, we have like Edwards, Edwards around saying, look, yeah, let's have more casino type gambling. There was a lot of opposition to it. People were opposed. They thought there'd be more street crime. They thought organized crime would take hold. So people were more afraid of it. But, but the compromise that surfaced was, okay, let's have casino gambling. Let's put it on a boat. 
if it's on a boat and doesn't work away, you can just go and pick up the anchor and let the, you know, let the boat go away. And actually, Mississippi pioneered that locally uh, because they had the same issues. And so when they started their boats along the Gulf Coast and Louisiana said, oh, that, that would work. In the same way that the lottery worked in Mississippi, Louisiana said, hey, you know, that, that's working okay. Uh, so it started here with the idea of, of, of having gambling boats, but they had to go out in the water. They couldn't just be there all the time. And so they had designated times that they had to go out. And so here, here you had these boats, several of them open. And they actually had a crew. They had a captain and the crew and, the, mm -hmm. you know, first mate. And I don't know what they did most of the day, but they just <laughs> sat there. And at certain times they had to go out. Uh, there were two boats along the uh, uptown called River Cities. Uh, Chris Himmler, a guy from Hawaii, said, well, the way we deal with this, we have two boats. And then when one boat goes out, we tell the people and they go to the other one. People didn't want to go be out on, on, on the water. They wanted mm -hmm. to be, be gambling. And so the idea of going out on the water wasn't popular. After a while, that just kind of died out, and that was changed. The law was changed. Okay, the boat doesn't have to go out, just as long as you still have the boat. Uh, eventually, that expanded, but the big move was in 2018, when finally they said, look, why don't we face reality here? Okay, people don't want to be out in the boat. I mean, it could be out by the water. And we, in, in Mississippi, already pioneered what was called dockside gambling. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, the gambling part was on a barge, essentially, but everything else, the hotels and everything, was on the land, and so this was the next step from Dockside. So they passed that law in 2018. So Kinner, at that time, started developing on the land um, next to the casino, the Treasure Chest mm -hmm. Casino, and it opened this week. Uh, it has twice as much gambling uh, space. They were bragging about it that it's wide open. It's not. It's all on one floor. It has three restaurants, and in the press conference, one of, uh, one of these spokesmen says, "You know, if someone in Kinner." Once the state, they need to go to, to Metairie. Now they can come to Kenner to get a stake. And so this is a great night for Kenner um, in terms of getting a stake. And so it's, um, it's open, and, you know, it seems to me it's going to you know, really do well because that part of Jefferson Parish is right next to the river parishes. And so mm -hmm. you got, you know, yeah, St. Right John, St. Charles, the boundary, all, all, yeah. all of the other parishes um, uh, coming in. But, you know, I, I remember when this was being debated, you know, before they approved it, uh, there were still the people that were saying, ah, gambling's a bad idea. And then the, the question came, well, where's the money going to go? And somebody came up with the idea. And I guess this is in the playbook for uh, developing gambling. It'll go to the police. And so from the very beginning, they said the money was going to be dedicated. But once they said that, okay, <laughs> that made it more sellable. And to this day, they're still saying, you know, there's a lot of revenue for the police and for capital improvements. And, it's, you know, it's probably not a bad idea. Uh, so the Canada Police Department is going to be well-funded, and if they need a good steak, they'll know where to go. Yeah, you know, so. to go. And so my question is, where's the boat? Uh, the, the boat, as far as I know, is still there. At some point, I think the uh, uh, Boyd Gambling, which owns it, at some point, they probably auction so, and sail it do off it again. Yeah. Okay. All right. I don't think it's a big market for uh, <laughs> used gambling boats right now. Okay. All righty. Thanks a lot. All right. And to wrap it up with you, because you went out there to what first was Jazz Land, then Six Flags, right. um, and is going to become something else soon, we hope. Uh, we'll see. Um, so it's Bayou Phoenix. Uh, it's a proposal to uh, have the youth, youth, youth athletic complex um, that would bring families from the region um, to stay in two new hotels um, and to enjoy a water park. Uh, there'd be a film studio on site. Um, this has been long in the making. It's an incredibly complicated redevelopment. Um, obviously, you've got uh, about 90 structures, I think, a little bit more on site, both decommissioned rides and old buildings that are derelict and everything. Um, the developers have had you know, the proverbial keys to the site uh, for seven months now um, when they signed a lease. This is something they've been arguing for years right. that they needed in order to get started and to show that they could actually do this. Um, seven months have passed and they've mostly been out there clearing brush and wrangling animals, snakes and alligators, um, while also starting to piece together um, plans for uh, just unfathomably difficult, uh, unfathomable to me, a layman, um, uh, demolition. Yeah, because there's a lot there to demolish, and mm, yeah. and they really don't know how extensive this demolition will be because they're not sure what's what's. That's right. Place. So they say that the, their initial uh, uh, quotes or bids for the demolition are ranging between the hundreds of thousands to the tens of millions because what they don't know is the condition of the pilings um, underneath all of the structures. So that needs to be assessed before they can really narrow in on the demolition. So, I mean, like structures like that big roller coaster, that's coming down. 
and they all say the that rides just and about such. every single thing on mm -hmm. site uh, needs to come down, save for um, a really notable old auditorium and maybe one mm -hmm. or two other utility buildings. Um, I, I think it, it's it's noteworthy to say too that they are offering um, some time frames now mm -hmm. that we can kind of go through that and look back on. But by late summer, they're saying by late summer they're saying the demo will have begun. And they're also saying that they're going to be announcing um, some tenants and operators for these new facilities. So um, we'll revisit that in a few months and see where they are. So did you get a chance to see the allig alligator that's taken up residence in the lagoon? There was an alligator in the lagoon. Um, uh, he, he swam right up to us and uh, seemed to be telling us that this was his land and he will be the arbiter of what goes in there. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. And then also you wrote about a big old kid, king snake there, too. That's um, right. Yeah, yeah, well, it just sort of makes sense. But the ho just quickly, any mm -hmm. idea? There are hotels that are in the plans to go there. Any idea who this might be? No, nope, not yet. Um, but again, um, we've got a clear kind of um, statement that they should be announcing operators um, within a few months. And, uh, and the developer again? Uh, Bayou Phoenix, this is led by Troy Henry, a Troy very well-known yeah. uh, New Orleans right. businessman. Yeah. Well, we wish him luck with it, because certainly right. there have been attempts over and over again to redevelop that land. I mean, it's been unused now for going on 20 years, That's right? right, since Next Katrina. Year, since yeah. Katrina. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just, it's been used by movie sets, you know, by movie companies for sets. Yeah. And all kinds of other people uh, who are trespassing on there. It's in a terrible state. Yeah. No, okay, no. Yeah. All right, thanks a lot, Ben. E, over to you for well, other stories. Well, this week we saw the 80th anniversary of D-Day, and in preparation for that, the... Uh, the state's Office of Veterans Affairs released some figures, which I at least wasn't aware of, I never heard of them, in terms of the number of casualties. There were 33 casualties from Louisiana um, that they, uh, the most came from Orleans Parish. That was six, but of course Orleans was the most populous uh, parish. But the, uh, the location where they're buried, that of the 33, 18 are buried in Normandy hmm. at, the, at the United States Cemetery there. Um, Twelve of them were at home, that, that, that they were shipped home. The families had the option of, of what to do. Uh, one in England, and there were two that were never found. And so what they had, they have plaques to them. And this is not to overshadow everybody else who was killed in every other right. war. It's just that we, we know this because it was a compact period of time that they get information. Okay, very touching. Thanks, Thank Steve. Missy. Violent crime continuing to plummet in New Orleans, a really welcome sign. We may yes. be returning to pre-pandemic levels, which were actually kind of historic lows for the city. I'll be taking a look at that in the upcoming weeks, as well as NOPD staffing. Okay, very good. Yeah. David? So the governor has employed a group called the Louisiana Coalition to Fix Our Roads, which is a private group of like road contractors, concrete companies, stuff like that, to come up with on their own dime a reorganization plan for DOTD, the State Highway Department. This is the same group that tried and failed a couple of times to get our gas tax raised, which hasn't been raised in 30 years. The idea here is they're going to come up, if they can come up with a plan to streamline DOTD, maybe they can convince the lawmakers to give us some more money. All right, very good. Very quick now, Ben. Uh, we recently reported on the mayor's travels um, that she'd been out of town one in five days over the last year and a half. We've now got the um, records of the expenses on that, and so very soon in the next couple of days over this weekend, I think we'll see um, uh, some reporting on what that has cost taxpayers. Okay, we'll be looking for that. Thanks a lot, guys, for being here. Thank you all for joining us. See you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening. Informed Sources is made possible in part by Susie and Pierre G. Villery. Public television is our passion. With so much content that WYES broadcasts and presents online, we are quite entertained and highly informed. Please join us in supporting WYES. This program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area.